Now, if it is in the midline, you will say mid sagittal plane or median plane. But as you move away from the midline, you can call it as paramedian or parasagittal plane. The present question is actually one section taken which is along the frontal plane as shown in the diagram and we want to name it anatomically. There are some anatomical planes which are imaginary planes we will be using while describing various details of the human body. When you say frontal plane, it is also called as the caudal plane and will be dividing the body into anterior and posterior aspect like as you see we need to magnify this diagram here the plane is passing such way that it is dividing the entire body into anterior and posterior halves and this frontal plane is also called as the coronal plane like in the skull we will have a coronal suture which is separating the frontal bone from the parietal bones posteriorly so the frontal plane or the coronal plane divides the body such way that it will have some portion anterior to the plane and the leftover to the posterior aspect. Let us look at some more details regarding these planes. So we were talking about the frontal plane or the coronal plane which is an anatomical plane, one imaginary plane put in such a way that the body is being divided into two parts anterior and posterior. So this is the marking for the plane as you can see it is going to divide the body into anterior and posterior like the pubis bone will come anterior whereas the sacrum bone will be on the posterior and the plane which is passing from right to left side is the coronal plane. Now let us look at this sagittal plane as well. Sagittal plane is passing anterior posteriorly and hence it will be dividing the body into two parts the right half and the left half. So as we mark this plane you can see it is passing in anterior to posterior direction and as is evident there will be a demarcation of right half of body from the left half of the body. Now if it is in the midline you will say mid sagittal plane or median plane but as you move away from the midline you can call it as paramedian or parasagittal plane and you can understand there can be multiple such planes which are anatomically called sagittal plane but they may not be dividing the body equally into right and left half if it divides equally then you can call it as mid sagittal plane or median plane and what is the purpose of taking those planes can be seen in the next diagram we'll be looking at some radiological pictures there is one more to be described and that is the transverse plane which is also called axial plane. Now transverse or the axial plane as the name is suggesting is running transversely or horizontally to the ground and divide the body into upper and lower part or you can say superior and inferior. So this is the marking of the plane and as you can see the body is being divided into the superior and inferior. It will become more clear when we are looking at the next diagram which is showing some radiological images. So here as we are looking at the radiological pictures, the axial plane or the transverse plane is dividing the body into superior and inferior components. Now when you talk about the CT scan, uh, transverse section it is by convention viewed from inferior to superior. And when you are looking from inferior to superior it is understood the lever which is on the right side will be shown here. So this is going to be the right sided organ, the lever. If we are looking from the inferior view, inferior to superior. And if we are talking about the spleen which is on the left side will be evident on the left side of the radiograph. So this is the spleen on the left side. So we must have the good orientation anatomically and obviously more posterior will be the spinal cord protected by the vertebral column. Right in front of the vertebra will be the aorta. In this case abdominal aorta. And this will be anterior abdominal wall. So anterior abdominal wall, posterior abdominal wall can be shown here. But this diagram is basically a transverse section. What about the question which we were having? The frontal plane or the coronal plane? As we have seen it is actually a plane passing right to left and dividing the body into anterior 
and posterior aspect and which can be seen here since it is a frontal plane you can see both the sides of the lung so there will be a right sided lung as evident here and you can also see the left lung the section taken in such way that part of the lung is lying anterior and what you're looking at is the posterior aspect of the lung the heart is sandwiched between the two so part of the lungs will be lying anterior to this plane and remaining parts posterior to this plane when it comes to sagittal plane which is running anterior posterior dividing the body into right and left half here you can see if it is more posterior the vertebral column can be seen as evident here and if you are talking about the pubis bone then it will be more anterior like marked here more anterior will be the urinary bladder which will be retropubic in location whereas if you are talking about the rectum it is more posterior so it will be lying more posterior but this plane which is anterior posterior or sagittal plane is basically dividing the body in such way that Part of the body remains on the right side and part of the body remains on the left side. When you continuously keep practicing such planes, it will be easier to quickly reach the answer. Let us go back to the question then. And as we described earlier, any section which is taken in the frontal plane is actually the coronal plane. Choice number B should be our answer. And it is going to divide the body into anterior aspect as is marked here and the posterior aspect we will keep our answer as choice number b here the present diagram is histological picture which is asking us to identify the arrow marked follicle and as we understand in the ovaries there are numerous follicles starting with the primordial follicles which are very small and more towards the periphery or cortex of the ovary and when you move towards the inner side towards the medulla you'll find the primordial follicles becoming primary follicles the primary follicles initially are covered by a single layered epithelial cells which can become stratified but still they are called as primary follicles and then we'll get the secondary follicle secondary follicle develop some spaces which are called enteral spaces and this is the enteral follicle or secondary follicle then these enteral spaces they merge become a large enteral space and here we got the tertiary follicle which is also called graphian follicle now in all these follicles we are going to have the oocyte the primary oocyte and just before ovulation this primary oocyte releases the first polar body and becomes the secondary oocyte so the structure which is undergoing ovulation is actually the secondary oocyte which will then later get fertilized if the sperms are available so all the follicles in the ovaries will have primary oocyte except the graphian follicle undergoing ovulation because that time the primary oocyte would have become secondary oocyte after release of the secondary oocyte the graphian follicle changes into the corpus luteum and corpus luteum will be sustained only if there was fertilization you can call it as corpus luteum of pregnancy fertilization is a very rare event mostly corpus luteum has to degenerate and becomes corpus alvicans now we'll be looking at some more details of this diagram before we could mark our answer it is the same diagram but with more details you are looking at the histological picture of the ovary in the periphery you will have the cortex and if you are going towards the center it will be the medulla now let us start from the periphery the cortex and the very first follicle we want to focus upon are the smallest of all primordial follicles as we zoom here these are the primordial follicles you can put number one here and you can find the primary oocyte is appearing very small towards the periphery of the ovary in the cortex of the ovary and is shown in magnified view here so these are the primary oocytes as you can see one marked here it will be having one nucleus which is evident here with the nucleus and what we see is these primary oocytes are covered by a single layer of flat cell, simple squamous epithelium. These simple squamous epithelium in the periphery, they are known as the follicular cells, as is evident here as well. They cover the primary oocyte and together this is the structure called as primordial follicle. Now, 
As we move on to the next follicle, we'll put the number two. It is called primary follicle, as is evident here. So number two is primary follicle, which is again showing the primary oocyte with the nucleus, nucleolus, and a magnified view here. This is the primary oocyte showing the nucleus, the nucleolus, and this time what we notice is the simple squamous epithelium which was covering primordial follicle has become simple cuboidal epithelium and this simple cuboidal epithelium in the beginning is single layered means simple but then it becomes stratified now may it be single layer or as is evident here may be stratified they are cuboidal cells the follicle cells and the structure is still called as primary follicle now some books will call this stratified cuboidal cells which we are naming as follicular cells as granulosa cells so the follicular cells once they become stratified they are also called as granulosa cells these granulosa cells are important because they are the ones which will be secreting the hormones like estrogen hormone but obviously for that purpose they need some stimulation from the peripheral cells there are some theca cells they'll be helping the granulosa cells to produce hormones like estrogen now may it be the primary follicle or the primordial follicle they are called as pre-entral follicles because the entral spaces appear in the secondary follicle. Actually, entral spaces will be developing within the stratified cuboidal cells. As you see here, this is the secondary follicle or the entral follicle where you see some entral space has been developing. And this space develops within the granulosa cells which are becoming more and more stratified. Let us magnify this diagram still further. This time we are talking about the secondary follicle or the antral follicle and as we notice here lies the primary oocyte surrounded by the follicular cells which are also called as granulosa cells so this is the primary oocyte as marked here and is surrounded by multi-layered granulosa cells the other name of follicular cells the cells which are immediately around the primary oocyte will be called as the corona radiata like marked here and the granulosa cells which are beyond that circular fashion arranged cells will be called as cubulus euphorus basically the granulosa cells which are beyond the margin of corona radiata so these cells will be called as cumulus euphorus so this is the secondary or antral follicle but even the tertiary follicle the next stage is also known as antral follicle we need to shift the diagram here and as is evident the antral space has become quite large we want to look at the magnified view of the tertiary or graphene follicle now which is given down here now talking about the graphene follicle it is having quite a large space the antral space leaving behind only a very small portion of granulosa cells looking like a stalk like you see here this portion is looking like a stalk and in the stalk what we'll find is the cumulus u for us so basically now what you find in graphene follicle is just before ovulation the primary oocyte would have become secondary oocyte as mentioned here and which is surrounded by some granulosa cells called as the corona radiata which themselves are surrounded by the cumulus euphorus which is also contributing to the stock portion here all the granulosa cells which are here surround the antral space all around and remember this oocyte the primary as well as secondary oocyte is covered by a glycoprotein membrane which is called as zona pellucida this zona pellucida is secreted by the oocyte and also contributed by the granulosa cells zona pellucida is important because it will prevent abnormal implantation of the secondary oocyte now this graphene follicle comes to the surface of the ovary and there it will be sending out the secondary oocyte undergoing ovulation let us look at that diagram as well as is evident here so as the graphene follicle comes to the surface of the ovary it will be extruding the secondary oocyte which is undergoing ovulation covered by the zona pellucida which is a glycoprotein membrane to prevent implantation and surrounded by some of the granulosa cells known as 
corona radiata. The cumulus oophorus is left here. The granulosa cells in the remnant of the follicle. These granulosa cells are important because they are the one which are producing not only estrogen but also which is shown. Now the remnant of the follicle is termed as the corpus luteum and corpus luteum will sustain only if there was fertilization. If the secondary oocyte was fertilized by the sperm pregnancy will set in and then you will call this corpus luteum as corpus luteum of pregnancy. PP pregnancy the progesterone hormone it will start secreting lot of progesterone and small amount of estrogen as well but as is understood most of the time the secondary oocyte do not meet with the sperm and there will be no fertilization in that case the corpus luteum which you see here cannot sustain itself and will be gradually changing into what is called as corpus alvicans and the secretion of progesterone estrogen will reduce gradually. This happens on day number 26th of the menstrual cycle. As we know menstrual cycle is considered as 28 day cycle normally and in the mid cycle that is day number 14 will be the ovulation or release of the secondary oocyte. Within 24 hours it must be fertilized which is a rare thing to happen. So if it is not fertilized on day number 25 or 26 of the menstrual cycle, the corpus luteum will regress and change into corpus alvicans and the cycle will repeat itself once again. So let us zoom out this diagram and go back to our question. As is evident here in the periphery, we have the primordial follicles. Number one, they were lined by simple squamous epithelium, single layer of flat cells. Then number two we have mentioned is going to have cuboidal cells and which can be single layer or they can become multi-layered stratified. This will be the primary follicle. Now may it be primordial or primary follicles, they are pre antral follicles. When it comes to number three, and number four, they are the antral follicles because they are showing this space which is called antral space within the granulosa cells. So this is the antral follicle or secondary follicle and this is the tertian or graphene follicle. All of them are having primary oocyte which will change into secondary oocyte just before ovulation and this secondary oocyte surrounded by corona radiata will be fertilized in the ampulla of the fallopian tube. If it is fertilized, pregnancy will set in and there will be a corpus luteum of pregnancy which will be secreting progesterone in larger amount. But since fertilization is a rare event, most of the time it regresses and becomes corpus alvicans as shown here. So what is this aromark follicle here? The antral spaces have just started appearing this secondary follicle or antral follicle. As you see, the answer should be choice number D here. If you are talking about the preantral then it will include the primary as well as the primordial follicles before the development of the antral space. Once you have the antral spaces within the granulosa cells visible, you should call it as antral follicle, which could be either secondary follicle or tertian graphene follicle. Choice number D should remain our answer. We got another question on histology section asking us about the epithelium of the fallopian tube or the uterine tube. And before we mark our answer, let us look at one diagram first. What we need to understand is, as you see here in the magnified picture for the female reproductive organs, it's the ovary which will be releasing the secondary oocyte which undergoes ovulation and then has to be fertilized. But for fertilization, it has to reach the ampulla of the fallopian tube. So how is it moving towards the ampulla of the fallopian tube from the peritoneal cavity? It is the uterine tube which will be helping the secondary oocyte to reach there. And uterine tube, they have smooth muscles in the wall doing some peristalsis helping the oocyte to move to the lumen of the uterine tube. Plus the uterine tube, the epithelium is ciliated and those cilia also help to move the oocyte towards the 
ampulla of fallopian tube. Now let us suppose there was copulation and the sperms have entered through the vagina into the uterus and they were moving towards the fallopian tube, towards the ampulla of the fallopian tube and there was fertilization. Now the zygote is formed. That zygote itself has to move towards the uterine cavity passing through the lumen of uterine tube because implantation occurs in the uterus. So this fertilized oocyte or the zygote, how does it move towards the uterus? Again the same thing, the smooth muscles in the uterine tube will be doing the peristalsis pushing the zygote towards the uterine cavity held by the cilia in the mucosal lining and that is what the question was asking us about. We have taken a section of the uterine tube and we see numerous mucosal folds lining the lumen of uterine tube. As you magnify the uterine tube which is also called fallopian tube, outside it is covered by the peritoneum which is the serosa and if we move towards the luminal side there is a second layer which is muscularis layer, the smooth muscles which was helping us in peristalsis and this is the luminal surface lined by the mucosal epithelium. Now the epithelium as we magnify it will be having two type of of cells. One we already mentioned ciliated columnar epithelium as shown by these black arrows these are the thread like cilia and cells are columnar cells with basal nuclei but interspersed between these ciliated columnar cells is a second type of cell which is called as the peg cell and this peg cell is having some microvilli and is identified by the fact that its nucleus is actually bulging towards the lumen of the uterine tube. As you will notice the green arrows, this is the nucleus which is bulging towards the apical surface and is bulging towards the lumen of the uterine tube. And these peg cells, they have microvilli, they secrete nutritive fluid into the lumen of uterine tube. So number one there are ciliated columnar epithelium with the oval basal nucleus towards the basement membrane whereas the second the peg cell which is giving the nutritive fluid the nucleus is not towards the basement membrane. It is actually bulging towards the lumen and that is the identification point for the peg cell. If you still magnify you can see some microvilli on the apical surface and then we can go back to our question. As we mentioned if we are talking about the fallopian or uterine tube the epithelium is basically ciliated columnar epithelium which you can find mentioned here in the choice number C but then along with that we also have peg cells. The appearance of this epithelium is like pseudo stratified columnar but it is not. It doesn't qualify as this particular epithelium. We should keep the answer as ciliated columnar. Now there are certain conditions like immotile cilia syndrome or Cartagener syndrome. In this Cartagener syndrome or immotile cilia syndrome, it might happen that the movement of the oocyte is not happening because cilia are immotile, leading to decreased fertility. Though this is specifically applicable to the male, the sperm tail is not moving immotile cilia for the sperm but it can very well apply to a female also because the cilia are not moving. There will be problem in moving the oocyte towards the uterine cavity leading to decreased fertility. Decreased fertility is a feature of Cartagena syndrome along with the chronic sinusitis and bronchiectasis. These features come again because cilia are not moving and we are unable to clear the infected mucus outside. The bacteria will persist in the sinus, persist in the lungs leading to bronchiectasis, sinusitis along with decreased fertility. These are the three specific findings in the Cartagener syndrome. But here we should keep our answer as choice number C. In this histological picture what we find is an arrow mark and question is asking us about the name of the muscle at that location. So when we magnify we'll find there is presence of some smooth muscle fibers in this region. Now there's a typical shape what you find here and along with that you also get some idea when you look at the choices like interetroid muscle, larynx, longitudinal muscle or the circular muscle of esophagus, the gut tube and trachealis, the respiratory tube. So there is something 
related to gut tube or the respiratory tube. And as we have seen many times, the shape of the trachea is very typically demonstrating the C-shaped cartilaginous ring. Made up of the hyaline cartilage is a very typical finding in the trachea. So trachea is actually having more than a dozen C-shaped rings, the hyaline cartilage, which help to maintain the patency of the trachea so that when we are breathing in the air, patency should be maintained. But they're not O-shaped, they are C-shaped. That means they will be deficient on the posterior aspect. And there, on the posterior aspect, the gap between the two ends of the C-shaped hyaline cartilage is filled by a muscle, muscle of trachea, the tracheolus muscle. So here we have got our answer. The answer being the tracheolus muscle, the smooth muscle on the posterior aspect of the tracheal lumen. But then we need more details. We have to magnify this area to look for the muscle fibers of tracheolus as well. In this diagram, we are looking from the posterior view, talking about the two tubes. As we know, the respiratory tube is present anterior and the gut tube is present posterior. So posteriorly, what you find is the gut tube or the esophagus, whose lumen you can see here, is evident. The food bolus will be passing to the posterior gut tube, esophagus. Lying anterior to that is the respiratory tube or the trachea. So this is the respiratory tube or the trachea, the lumen is evident here. And as we have mentioned, to maintain the patency of the trachea, we have the C-shaped rings, the hyaline cartilaginous ring, which you see are evident here, but there is a deficiency on the posterior aspect. And that is a deficiency where we are having the tracheolus muscle bridging between the two ends of the C-shaped cartilage. Now, what is the purpose of keeping a deficiency there? See, when we are taking the food, the food is passing through the esophagus, which is having a narrow lumen. The lumen has to enlarge. So there must be some space available. The distension of the esophagus goes into the wall of the trachea posteriorly and compromises the lumen of the trachea during swallowing. So just to allow for the distension of the esophagus. Obviously, during swallowing, the tracheolus muscle must be relaxing so as to provide some distension of the esophagus. What about the coughing? When we are coughing, the tracheolus muscle will contract. And as the tracheolus muscle will contract, it will compromise the lumen of the trachea so as to force the air out of the trachea to cough out the mucus or any foreign body. This is under parasympathetic nervous system, cholinergic system. Tracheolus muscle is working under acetylcholine, the parasympathetic system. And you can imagine what happens in asthma. Asthma is the hyperresponsive tracheobronchial tree. There are a lot of secretions and the muscles are undergoing into contraction, compromising the lumen of the respiratory tube, difficulty breathing. So in asthma, the tracheolus muscle will be found in contraction, compromising the lumen of the trachea as well, along with the bronchi. Anyhow, we want to take one histological picture here. And as we do that, we'll find this is the trachea anteriorly with the lumen here. And this is the esophagus posteriorly with the lumen there. In the trachea, we have mentioned there'll be the C-shaped cartilaginous rings, which are deficient posteriorly. And that deficiency is being filled by some muscle called as the tracheolus muscle. So that is what we want to look into one histological specimen. We'll also talk about the tracheal mucosal epithelium, which is respiratory, so pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. What about the epithelium of the esophagus, which is lying posterior? Esophagus, the epithelium is stratified squamous epithelium. So let us look at that as well in the next diagram, which is a histological specimen. By taking a section here at this level, this is the low magnification. And here you can see the higher magnification, which we yet need to magnify. But you should understand this is the lumen of the trachea. 
and this is the limit of the esophagus which is in collapsed state. In this section, somehow the esophagus which lies posterior to trachea has moved to one direction. What you can see is the limit of trachea lined by respiratory epithelium which is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium whereas the epithelium of the esophagus will be lined by stratified squamous epithelium. Let us first focus upon trachea here. So we are magnifying this area, the wall of the trachea where the arrow mark was given, the smooth muscle tracheolish muscle will be evident and it is here. This is the region where you find some smooth muscle fibers and they belong to the tracheolish muscle. If you are talking about the C-shaped cartilage, it is lying anterior to that. So this is the tracheolus muscle and if you want to talk about the C-shaped hyaline cartilaginous ring then it is here anteriorly and lateral to the lumen of the trachea. And if we focus upon the epithelium, the tracheal epithelium is respiratory epithelium, pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And you can see there are some seromucinous glands as well evident in the tracheal wall. Their secretions will increase in asthma under parasympathetic hyperactivity. More of a style choline is available in the system and the tracheolus muscle is undergoing contraction so that the lumen of the trachea gets compromised, difficulty breathing. Now let us focus upon this structure as well that is the wall of the esophagus lying posteriorly in the next diagram and as we Magnify this area, you can find this is the epithelium we are talking about. It is multilayered stratified squamous epithelium lining the lumen of the esophagus. Esophagus will have mucosal epithelium along with that. There'll be the submucosa in the submucosa. Typically, there'll be glands in the esophagus as evident here. The magnified picture of this portion. And then you can also mention the muscular layer of the esophagus. Since it is a gut tube, there will be inner circular layer and if you are talking about the outer, it will be the longitudinal layer. They are all smooth muscles basically. And that is what was mentioned in the question as well. If you remember, the question was asking about some arrow mark here and choices were tracheolus muscle, interarytenoid or the longitudinal muscle of the esophagus or the circular muscle of the esophagus. Let us go back to the question then. So that was the question, identify the arrow marked muscle which we have seen bridging the gap between the two ends of the C-shaped hyaline cartilage is the muscle of trachea, the tracheolus and the options along with that were longitudinal muscle of esophagus, the outer longitudinal muscle and the circular muscle which is inner muscle layer of esophagus, they were in the option. But anyhow, we have got our answer, choice number D should remain as the answer. There comes another question on histology and asking us about the marked cells in the diagram and what are they going to secrete. The options which are available are some hormones being secreted by these cells. Is it the thyroxine or calcitonin or is it adrenaline prolactin? Prolactin means you are talking about pituitary gland. Here it is the adrenal gland. But if you say calcitonin, parafollicular C cells of thyroid secreting thyrocalcitonin. And thyroxine is of course thyroid follicles. Now, as we keep practicing the diagrams, this is not a diagram for pituitary or adrenal gland. This is a diagram for thyroid follicles. This is one of the thyroid follicle which is filled with gelatinous substance, the thyroglobulin, the precursor of thyroxine hormone. And thyroid follicles usually, they are lined by the cuboidal epithelium, though it may be squamous or columnar, depending upon the activity status of the follicle. Usually central spherical nucleus and cuboidal epithelium. But the marker is not upon the lining epithelium of the thyroid follicle. It is actually on the sides of the follicle. 
like one follicle here, another follicle here, and among them, parafollicular C cells of thyroid producing thyrocalcitonin. So, how do you identify that they are parafollicular C cells? C cell is clear cell. They are called clear because their cytoplasm is not taking more of the stain. Like if you look at these cells, they are darker staining, but the parafollicular C cells are lighter staining since they have less of endoplasmic reticulum. So they take lighter stain plus they are larger as compared with the cells in the thyroid follicle. These cells are larger and they are paler, pale color, clear and they'll have a lot of electrodense granules and those granules are basically the thyrocalcitonin. This hormone is antagonizing the parathyroid hormone secreted by parathyroid glands. Whenever there is raised level of blood calcium, the parafollicular C cells are activated. They reduce the blood calcium level. And how? They're working on the bone. In the bone, they will be suppressing the osteoclast cells and they also help in deposition of calcium into the osteoid. osteoid calcification is increased so by these two methods they are going to reduce the blood calcium and you must remember what is their embryological origin the parafollicular C cells are derived from neural crest cells populating the ultimate wrinkle body in the pharyngeal pouch region they are derived from neural crest cells so the marked cell secrete which hormone the parafollicular C cells they secrete thyrocalcitonin choice number B should be our answer here then a photograph of baby is shown here and what we notice is the skull cap is missing. The brain is exposed to the exterior and it is actually small brain. So small brain which is exposed to the exterior with the missing cranial vault. It is a case of an encephaly. And why do we get an encephaly? Some options are given non closure of anterior or posterior neuropore, or the anterior neural tube is open, or whether there is a problem with the skull bones. We'll mark our answer, but let us first look at the embryological development of neural tube first. Here we need to look from the dorsal view of a developing baby where in the beginning we'll have a plate, the neural plate which then gradually will become a neural tube and this neural tube will have one anterior opening and one posterior opening. This is called as the anterior or cranial or you can say cephalic neuropore which has to close by day number 25 of the development and if you are talking about the posterior or you can say the caudal neuropore then it will be closing after few more days or day number 28. If the anterior neuropore is not closed there could be a case of anencephaly. If posterior neuropore is not closed there can be a case of rachiskisis. So let us revise this here as well in the beginning. There is a neural plate. Looking from the dorsal view of the baby, you have taken a section also. And in the beginning, there is a plate, which is neural plate. But then this neural plate on the dorsal side of the baby is developing a neural groove. And this neural groove, you will notice, will gradually fuse and become a neural tube. So what you see here is a neural groove going to fuse and become a neural tube. This is the fusion which occurs usually in the cervical region, the first fusion. And now after this fusion, a tube is forming. But this tube will have some opening like this is the anterior or cranial neuropore and then we have the posterior or caudal neuropore. Anterior neuropore closing by day number 25 of development and posterior after three days or you can say day number 28. If they are not closing, there will be open neural tube defects like there could be anencephaly or rachiskisis. Sometimes both of them are open then there will be cranio rachiskisis. In anencephaly, the brain is exposed outside and in rachiskisis, the spinal cord is exposed outside. There will be spina bifida as well. Means part of the vertebra covering the spinal cord will be missing. Whereas in anencephaly, part of the skull will be missing. The protective bones are missing in respective 
pathology. Let us look at the photograph of some babies now suffering from these anomalies. So the examiner will be showing you some photographs like these and you have to identify the anomaly. Here you can see the baby is having small brain which is exposed to the exterior since the cranial vault is missing. So non-fusion of the anterior neuropore leading to an encephaly or it could be non-fusion of the posterior neuropore leading to rachiskisis. Some part of the bone will be missing, spina bifida defect will be there. So non-fusion of the posterior or caudal neuropore. Sometimes both the pores are non-fused and you get the third condition. Let us look at the photograph of that anomaly as well which is called as craniorachiskisis. You see anterior neuropore is open, small brain exposed to the exterior, skull vault is missing and then you also find some part of the vertebra is missing. The spinal cord neural tissue is exposed to the outside, CSF is leaking outside, skin is at the periphery, do not cover the defect. So these are features of rachiskisis. But since both of the anomalies are present together, you call it as craniorachiskisis. But if we are specifically talking about this baby, they are showing it from the front view, not showing the posterior view. So we can comment only upon one thing, that it is a case of an encephaly, non-closure of anterior neuro. Four. So we have to find our answer among the options and that is choice number A, non-closure of anterior. Remember it could also be named as the cranial or cephalic neuropore and this happens due to deficiency of folic acid. So we must give folic acid supplements in the antenatal, natal and postnatal period of pregnancy in all the females to prevent occurrence of open neural tube defects. Here we keep our answer as choice number A. Then what is choice number B? Choice number B is what we call as rachiskisis. And choice number C, if you say entire neural tube is open, then craniorachiskisis. But here the answer should remain choice number A. As we notice, the examiner has mentioned all the extraocular muscles have been paralyzed. And in such a scenario, where could have been the lesion? What is the most probable level of the lesion? And the various components of brainstem are given. Though it may appear as a simple question, but take it from me, it is not. But anyhow, let us try to find the best possible answer here. Here we need to discuss the upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons as well. Say this is the midline of the body and we are representing the upper motor neurons which are there in the cerebral hemispheres. And these upper motor neurons are sending the axons down towards the lower motor neurons which are present in the brain stem to control the muscles of the eyeball. So as we draw the brainstem, brainstem will have three components that is the midbrain, inferior to that is pons and then we have got the medulla oblongata. There you can show some lower motor neurons. At the upper midbrain level we have the lower motor neurons to control the third nerve whereas at the lower midbrain you have the lower motor neurons for the cranial nerve number four, the trochlear nerve. And then when we talk about the abducens nerve, nerve number six, you'll find the lower motor neuron for the sixth nerve will be there in the pons. This is the formula for the eyeball muscles. The eyeball muscles are supplied by nerve number three, four, and six. Now you have to mention about the fibers of upper motor neurons because they are going to modulate the activity of lower motor neurons. This is the corticonuclear tract which keep running downwards and modulate the function of the lower motor neuron. You will notice that at a particular level it will be giving two sets of axons. One which will be synapsing ipsilaterally and another which is synapsing contralaterally. That means the lower motor neurons in the brainstem have bilateral representation. The fibers are coming from the right sided cerebral cortex, but it is controlling the lower motor neurons not only on the right side, but also the left side. This is valid for the number three, four, six, or whichever cranial nerve you are talking about. Though 
there will always be some exceptions. In some cranial nerves, the crossing of the fibers are very minimal. For example, for trochlear nerve, the crossing fibers are very minimal. So what happens is, whenever we want to move the muscles of the eyeball, the upper motor neurons will be sending commands to the lower motor neurons and then they'll be firing accordingly to move the muscles. Now let us assume that we have got a lesion at the level of upper midbrain compromising the corticonuclear tract here on the right side. So it is a right-sided lesion and corticonuclear tract has been compromised. It is obvious that the number 3, 4 and 6 which were receiving the fibers will get compromised. So what do you think? Will the muscles of the eyeball be paralyzed or not? In fact, they should not be. And why is that? Because we have mentioned they have bilateral representation. What does that mean? That means maybe the corticonuclear tract on the right side has been compromised, but the left side corticonuclear tract is still functional. And this left-sided corticonuclear tract is still supplying the neurons on the same side and also on the opposite side. So what is the message here? The message is left corticonuclear tract is still working and the muscles will be still working. Maybe there is a compromised corticonuclear tract on the right side. The muscles will not be paralyzed because they have bilateral representation. A fiber system compromise on this side cannot paralyze the muscles here because they are still being innervated from the opposite side. Then where should be the lesion? if? You want the eyeball muscles to be paralyzed. The lesion should obviously be at the level of upper midbrain, but bilateral. Only if you have bilateral lesion, which is going to compromise even the fiber system of the left side, then you'll find paralysis of all extraocular muscles. Now, why the lesion can be only at the upper midbrain? Why can't it be? in the lower midbrain or in the pons or in the medulla? It's obvious. If the lesion was at a lower level, say for example, at the level of pons, then only the sixth nerve or the fibers which come below that, they will be compromised. In that scenario, nerve number three, four will be still working. So the lesion cannot be at a lower level. Lesion must be at upper level before you are giving the corticonuclear tract innervation to number three, four or six because all of them are paralyzed as the examiner has mentioned. So let us go back to our question then and find out the answer there. As we notice, all the extraocular muscles have been paralyzed and the most probable level of lesion is. It is upper midbrain and not only unilateral, it must be bilateral lesion in the upper midbrain. And the answer cannot be pons or medulla because in that case, whichever nerves were coming from the midbrain or number three, four, they'll be still working. Some of the eyeball muscles will be still working and which is not the case scenario here. So the only possible answer is choice number A and that too, bilateral upper midbrain lesion. Present question is uh, asking us about the patient who is having certain clinical features as depicted in the following diagram. So which syndrome is that? And as we keep practicing various diagrams, depicting the clinical features of different syndromes may be the Wellenberg or the Millard-Gubler syndrome, Weber or brown sequard syndrome. Let us try to find out the details and then we can come back and mark our answer here. And as we'll find out, it is a case of brown sequard syndrome. But how? That's what we have to explain. By drawing a transverse section of the spinal cord. Now, when you are talking about the spinal cord, we have got the H-shaped gray matter where you will have some of the neurons. For example, these are the anterior horn cells and they are controlling some of the skeletal muscles in the body. Now these anterior horn cells are lower motor neurons and they are to be controlled by upper motor neurons in the cerebrum. They are sending some fibers down called as corticospinal tract or the pyramidal tract. So let us show the pyramidal tract as well. The corticospinal tract which is collection of some axons can be shown on either side. These axons are supposed to be originating from the cerebral cortex, the upper motor neurons and 
coming down to control the lower motor neurons which we have already mentioned as anterior horn cells so these are the lower motor neurons they'll be synapsing upon and then the lower motor neurons will send the fibers to control the skeletal muscles now what happens is when there is a case of brown sequard syndrome half of the spinal cord has been compromised maybe it is some road traffic accident which has compromised half of the spinal cord and in that scenario what we'll notice is there is compromised upper motor neuron as well as lower motor neurons say it is right-sided brown sequard syndrome now, due to the compromised corticospinal tract, all the muscles which are below the level of lesion, they will have UMN type of palsy, means spastic paralysis, below the level of lesion. As you notice, if we are assuming the level of lesion is here, all the muscles which are below the level of lesion will have spastic paralysis because it is human type of lesion for the body below the level of lesion but at the level of lesion since the lower motor neurons are compromised there will be flaccid paralysis or what you call as hypotonic paralysis so why do you have flaccid paralysis or hypotonic paralysis at the level of lesion due to the injury of lower motor neurons at that specific level and why do you have spastic paralysis below the level of lesion due to injury of a bundle of axons being carried by corticospinal tract which are supposed to supply lower motor neurons not only at this level but at the lower levels also so all those axons in a bundle have been compromised that's why human type of palsy or spastic palsy below the level of lesion now this is about the motor problem what about the sensory problem let us assume this is a right-sided brown sequard syndrome at the level of t10 spinal segment and because half of the spinal cord has been compromised one sensory pathway which is called as the spinothalamic tract carrying the pain and temperature from the opposite side of the body has been compromised so if spinothalamic tract is compromised there will be contralateral loss of pain temperature in the patient as you see there is loss of pain and temperature on the opposite side of the lesion and this will be happening one or two segment below the level of lesion and why the loss of pain and temperature is one or two segment below the level of lesion because the pain and temperature fibers carried by spinal thalamic tract they have to ascend one or two segment before they cross to the opposite side if the lesion is on the right side problem will be on the left side one and two segment below the level of lesion if the lesion is at t10 level the problem will begin t12 segment downward this loss of pain temperature due to the lesion of spinal thalamic tract what about the other sensory loss we understand if there is right-sided brown sequard syndrome then the right-sided dorsal column will be compromised which is constituted by the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. So this cuneatus and gracilis making the dorsal column of spinal cord, what sensations they carry? They carry five sensations from the same side of the body, which are fine touch and pressure vibration and stereonosis and conscious proprioception. So if we have right-sided hemisection of spinal cord the right-sided brown sequard syndrome there will be loss of five sensation on the same side you will notice loss of tactile discrimination which is fine touch and vibration proprioception stereonosis lost ipsi laterally below the level of lesion so there is some sensory loss on the same side of lesion and there is some sensory loss contralaterally these are all specific features of hemisection of spinal cord which is also called as the brown sequard syndrome so that is our answer the clinical features are suggested of which syndrome contralateral loss of pain temperature ipsilateral loss of pressure vibration stereonosis etc flaccid paralysis at the level of lesion and spastic paralysis below the level of lesion which is not mentioned in the diagram but it will be evident there and this cannot fit 
at all in any of the conditions like Wallenberg syndrome. In Wallenberg syndrome, which is lateral medullary ischemia, there'll be some clinical features related to cranial nerves as well. Similarly, in miller gubler there should be some cranial nerve involvement. And if it comes to Weber syndrome, again, upper midbrain, is compromised. Cranial nerve features should be there. It's not mentioned. So it cannot be anything to do with AVC, which are brainstem lesions basically. So our only possible answer is choice number D, the brown Chiquard syndrome. The typical clinical features as evident here. This is a sagittal section of the head and neck region and there is a marker they are asking us which structure is that. As we zoom on to this area it is actually a lid over the larynx. Larynx is called glottis so it is above the glottis, epiglottis. But before we put our answer here let us magnify this area and look at some more landmarks. So as we magnify this particular region here, let us start with the arrow mark itself. It is showing a lid over the larynx, that is epiglottis. The magnified view is here. Epiglottis is like a lid over the larynx. It is made up of elastic cartilage. Now, if this is epiglottis, then where is the glottis? It is down here, the larynx. We'll find there is a false vocal cord and there's a true vocal cord. This is the sinus of the larynx. So this is the glottis. To cover that, there is epiglottis. This glottis region, you can see here as well. This is the false vocal cord. This is the true vocal cord. That is the sinus of the larynx. So this is the region of the glottis. And of that is the epiglottis, the aromark. Now we want to look at some more cartilages which belong to the larynx. There's a ring-shaped circular cartilage which is covering the larynx, cricoid cartilage. It can be seen anteriorly as well as posteriorly. So you can find the anterior and posterior lamina of the cricoid cartilage in a magnified view here. This is the anterior cricoid cartilage and you can also show the posterior lamina of the cricoid cartilage which is comparatively larger. Now, this is the ring-shaped cricoid cartilage. It is the lowermost cartilage of the larynx because below that begins the trachea and trachea will have C-shaped cartilaginous ring which is also hyaline cartilage similar to the cricoid cartilage but cricoid cartilage is all around. It is circular whereas below the cricoid cartilage the trachea will have only C-shaped cartilages. Posteriorly they are deficient. There you have seen tracheolus muscle will be present. Anyhow, if this is the cricoid cartilage, where is the thyroid cartilage? It is at a higher level which you can show here. This is the thyroid cartilage of the larynx lying in front of the glottis. Now if that is the thyroid cartilage of the larynx which is going to have the Adam's apple as well protecting the larynx posteriorly, which bone is above that and below the mandible? The hyoid bone. So we have to show the hyoid bone as well which is here. This is the location of the hyoid bone and what is just above the hyoid bone? It is the tongue which is chiefly constituted by skeletal muscle and uh, this muscle which is evident is the protruder of the tongue, the safety muscle of tongue, genioglossus muscle making bulk of the tongue. Now if that is the tongue region you can show that here as well. That is where you'll have the genioglossus muscle attaching to the genial tubercle of the mandible bone. This is the mandible bone where you have the lower teeth making the joint. So this is the mandible bone. From the genial tubercle comes the genioglossus. Below that will be the hyoid bone. Then the thyroid cartilage of the larynx. Some more details we have to see. What is posterior to the tongue and anterior to the epiglottis? What is this space here? Magnified view, this space here which is lying posterior to the tongue and anterior to epiglottis. This is called as vellicula. So the space here is called as 
valleycula. Now we need to know all this because examiner is putting markers at certain places and we have to discuss their location appropriately between epiglottis and the arytenoid cartilage of the larynx which lies posteriorly is a fold airy epiglottic fold so arytenoid cartilage which belongs to the larynx posteriorly and the epiglottis which lies anteriorly there's a fold mucosal fold we are calling it as accordingly arytenoid epiglottic fold which is marked here in fact above the cricoid cartilage you have two of the larynx cartilages one on each side so sitting over the cricoid cartilage you have the arytenoid cartilage and between arytenoid and epiglottis you have airy epiglottic fold so just have some good idea about the various landmarks here and we can go back to our question now the marked structure as we see is none other than the epiglottis if that is the epiglottis then where is the glottis it is here this is the glottis the larynx proper so we'll keep our answer as the lid over larynx or the epiglottis choice number a here this question is asking us about the termination of spinal cord in a newborn baby. So when we are looking at the termination of spinal cord in an adult, it is different from a newborn. And why is that so? We have to look at the embryological development for the reason behind that. Now here we are looking from the side view of a developing baby and as it is understood in the beginning. The length of the vertebral column is same as the length of the spinal cord. Here we are showing the vertebral column and as we see a baby at the age of 9 week intrauterine life, the length of the spinal cord is same as the length of the vertebral column. In fact, the tip of the spinal cord is fused with the coccyx bone there. But as the development proceeds further, we find the length of the vertebral column is becoming longer and longer as compared with the spinal cord. The spinal cord is gradually seem to be regressing higher and higher so you see the length of the spinal cord in an adult is 45 centimeter whereas the length of the vertebral column is 60 centimeter now maybe the spinal cord appears to be going higher and higher as compared with the vertebral column which is growing faster and longer in length the original attachment of the spinal cord with the coccyx bone is still persisting as you notice this was the original attachment with the coccyx bone and this is still persisting and that attachment of the spinal cord to the coccyx bone is called as the phylum terminal it is a fibrous structure which keep attaching the tip of the spinal cord with the coccyx bone down there maintaining the original attachment but obviously the coccyx bone has moved quite far away from the tip of the spinal cord now where was the termination of spinal cord in a newborn baby say for example here 40 weak fetus you have to remember it lies at the upper border of l3 vertebra though some books will say it is at the lower border of l3 vertebra choose upper border as your first answer if not found take it as lower border we need to know the termination of spinal cord because we can do lumbar puncture only below that level so it will be done either at l4-5 level or l5-s1 level for a newborn baby to aspirate the CSF or inject the spinal anesthesia. Now what about the adult? In adult level the spinal cord has still migrated upward and terminates at the lower border of L1 vertebra. So in an adult it is at the transpyloric plane because the pylorus of stomach is also lying at lower border of L1 vertebra that is also the termination of adult spinal cord and if you want to do lumbar puncture you have to do it below that. Preferably it could be L3-4 or or L45 levels to aspirate CSF or give spinal anesthesia. So for an adult it is L1 lower border the transpyloric plane for a newborn baby it is the upper border of L3 vertebra. With that view let us go back to the question. 
And as I mentioned, the termination spinal cord and newborn baby should be upper border of L3 vertebra. If that is not given, you have to choose the lower border of L3 vertebra. And that is choice number C. Here comes as the answer. If you are asking for an adult, you should say transpallic plane or lower border of L1 vertebra. But here we need to keep our answer as choice number C. In this diagram, we are supposed to identify the arrow marked chamber. Then what are we looking at? Actually, it is a transverse section in the thorax region. As you will notice, this is the sternum bone anteriorly and it is articulating with the ribs on either side. Now, if that is a scenario, this is a transverse section. What else can we see here? What we notice is this is the marking for the lungs. Now, if these are the lungs, one of them here, the other one is marked here, it becomes obvious that we are being asked about the structure which is sandwiched between the lungs, the heart, the four chambers of the heart and they are marking one of the chamber, the most posterior. Sternum is anterior, this is posterior. Posteriorly, you will have the vertebra on the vertebra but this is the lumen of the esophagus. So which chamber is near the esophagus posteriorly? When you do transesophageal echocardiography, which is the chamber you are looking for? When you do transesophageal echocardiography, the chamber which you are looking for is left atrium, the most posterior. Now, if this is the left atrium, which view is this basically? See, it is a transverse section of the thorax region, mostly seen from inferior to superior. And if it is inferior to superior, and this is the left atrium, this must be the left lung, and this must be the right lung from inferior view. And then you can see the heart is more towards the left side. It is the right lung. Right lung will have a mediastinal impression of which chamber of the heart. If this is the left atrium, this must be the lumen of right atrium. And if that is the lumen of the right atrium, giving mediastinal impression on the right lung, what is the sternocostal surface of the heart chiefly contributed by? It is the right ventricle. This chamber is right ventricle, though the marking of right ventricle is here. It is the right ventricle which is in relation with the sternum and the costa, sternocostal surface. Now, if this is right ventricle, then what is on the left side? This is the left ventricle. And between the two, between the two, you can mention is the interventricular septum. So this is the interventricular septum. You can notice one thing. The thickness of the wall of the left ventricle, if you compare it with the wall of the right ventricle, the ratio is 1 is to 3. Left ventricle is three times thicker because it has to push the blood into systemic circulation. Whereas the right ventricle, the wall is comparatively thin because right ventricle has to push the blood into pulmonary circulation only towards the lungs. So these are the four chambers of the heart and the arrow mark is towards the left atrium. But then let us look at some embryological details as well. What is the orientation of the four chambers of the heart if you look from the front view? If you look from the front view during development, there are two heart tubes which will fuse to become one heart tube. And this heart tube will then give us the atria and the ventricles. Lower is the primitive atrium and it is receiving the blood, whereas upper is the primitive ventricle which is pushing the blood out of the heart tube. Later, the septa will come, like there'll be interventricular septum dividing the ventricles into right left ventricle and interatrial septum dividing the atrium into right and left atrium. Now, what happens is there is looping of the heart. The tube is looping and it loops in such way that the atria moves posterior and superior and correspondingly the ventricles come anterior and inferior. So what we notice is when it comes to the right atrium, left atrium separated by interatrial septum, 
they are going posterior superiorly and correspondingly the right ventricle and left ventricle are coming antero inferiorly as you see the right ventricle and left ventricle separated by interventricular septum will be coming antero inferiorly so in anatomical position what is more anterior and inferior it is the ventricles and what is more posterior and superior it is the atria and the heart is more towards the left side and rotated so that what is more posterior is left atrium whereas the right atrium has come more towards the right side so what is most posterior the left atrium whereas posterior right and anterior is the right atrium what is most anterior then it is right ventricle and where is left ventricle it is anterior to the left and inferior this will become more clear when you look at a diagram so here is the front view of the heart this will be the location of the interventricular septum most of the anterior surface of the heart is the right ventricle as you see here partly it is left ventricle as it is mentioned here between the two interventricular septum then where is the left atrium it is the most posterior chamber and where is the right atrium it is partly seen here but it is not only anterior it is to the right side as well as posterior anyhow if you are looking at this patient lying supine in a bed this is the foot end that is the head end looking from inferior to superior you have taken a transverse section that was the question given to us what about the four chambers of the heart as you notice the arrangement of the four chambers can be seen here if you're talking about the right atrium which is here you can mention the right atrium to be located here now if this is the right atrium then what about the right ventricle the right ventricle you can demonstrate again more anteriorly and it is here this is the right ventricle then what about the left chambers this will be the left atrium and the left ventricle which you can mention here this is the left atrium if we are looking from the inferior view and obviously the left ventricle is towards the left side this is the left ventricle so can we represent the same story in the transverse section of the heart inferior to superior which we already have done so as you see these are the four chambers of the heart and you can demarcate them now as you have done here the same way it is seen here as well what is the most anterior bone the sternum and the costa sternocostal region so here is the sternum bone and these are the costa on either side and which chamber is related with the sternocostal surface that is the right ventricle so it is the right ventricle which is related to the sternocostal surface and which chamber is the posterior most towards the vertebrae column that will be the left atrium as you see here this is the chamber left atrium which is towards the vertebral column and that is the esophagus if you do trans esophageal echocardiography the first chamber which you see is left atrium this is the esophageal lumen so this is left atrium this is the left ventricle as we have mentioned the left atrium and left ventricle sternocostal surface is right ventricle which you can show here sternocostal surface the right ventricle and then what you see making an impression on the mediastinal surface of the right lung is right atrium this is the right atrium as you can see right atrium right ventricle we already have mentioned here as well in a transverse section in fear view of the heart so you must have some orientation to identify these chambers correctly and that is what we have done let us go back to the question then we were being asked about the arrow mark chamber and we have seen it is related to the esophageal figures posteriorly the most posterior chamber and is none other than the left atrium choice number b is our answer here now we are being asked about the cardiac valves auscultation sites like you are putting the stethoscope and then locating the auscultation site on the anterior thoracic wall of the patient to listen to the heart sound and also if there are any murmurs or other pathological sounds we have to understand that the location of the auscultation site is different from the location of the cardiac valves and why is that we'll find out plus one more thing as we talk about the heart sound which is lub and dope 
how these sounds are produced. So this is the love S1, the first heart sound and dup, which is the S2, the second heart sound. These heart sounds are auscultated when there is closure of the cardiac valves. There are four cardiac valves and we can just mention for the first heart sound, we have the M1, T1 and for the second heart sound, it is the A2, P2. M is the mitral valve, which is the left atrioventricular valve and T1 is the right atrioventricular valve which we will be locating in a diagram also. So when there is a closure of the mitral valve and tricuspid valve they'll be coming the first heart sound with the characteristic of lub, lub, dup, lub, dup. Now obviously mitral valve and tricuspid valve they're closing at a time difference but they are so close that they appear to be just one sound. Sometimes there can be splitting of the heart sound. Then you will find M1 is heard earlier as compared with T1. And that is also the natural sequence of the closure of the valves. Left AV valve closer is earlier compared with the right AV valve. Now, when it comes to the dup sound, the second heart sound, it is A2, P2. A2 means the aortic valve closure is going to produce a sound. And P2 is the pulmonary valve closure producing the sound. And again, aortic valve closure earlier as compared with the pulmonary. But they are closing so close to each other that the sounds are overlapping and they come as a single sound. In pathology, they might be separated. Split heart sounds. Now, the other purpose of auscultation on the antithoracic wall is to search for the murmurs. Sometimes the flow is not smooth. There can be turbulence in the blood flow due to defective valve. It could be aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation. If there is a narrowing of the valve, stenosis. And if there is a damaged wall and there is a backflow of blood, then regurgitation. That will produce murmurs and you can auscultate those murmurs at specific locations. For aortic valve you have to go here, for pulmonary valve you have to go there. So where exactly that's what we need to find out before we mark our answer here. But let us first focus upon the cardiac blood flow in the next diagram. And here we are looking from the front view once again on the anterior thoracic wall. What we understand is that the body above the diaphragm drains into superior vena cava and body below the diaphragm drains into inferior vena cava. Both of them will be then draining into the right atrium of the heart. Let us locate the flow now. This is blood from the upper body drained by the superior vena cava is shown here. And then we can also locate the blood flow from the inferior body carried by inferior vena cava. So this is the blood coming from the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. Now may it be the IVC blood or the SVC blood. Both of them are reaching the right atrium here. And from the right atrium, we have to send this blood towards the right ventricle. There will be atrial systole, the cardiac contraction which will push the blood from the right atrium into right ventricle through the right atrioventricular valve which is called as the tricuspid valve as it is having three cusp tricuspid valve and let us locate it here the blood is being pushed into the right ventricle as you can see and this has to pass through the right AV valve or the tricuspid valve as shown here so this is the location of the tricuspid valve and as the tricuspid valve will be closing after the atrial systole is over it will produce a sound the T1 that will be the first heart sound component. Now this blood which has come to the right ventricle will be again forced out of the right ventricle by ventricular contraction the systole and let us follow the blood flow towards the lungs now. To reach the lungs the blood has to pass through the pulmonary trunk and before that we have got the pulmonary valve. Let us locate it here the pulmonary valve and as the pulmonary valve will be closing after contraction it will be producing the sound the P2 leading to second heart sound one of the component like we said the first heart sound is M1 T1 but we have seen just the T1 here and second heart sound is A2 P2 we have seen just the P2 so what about the A2 we are continuing with that but as we have seen the SVC and IVC is pouring the blood into right atrium going to right ventricle from from there reaching into the pulmonary trunk and it moves towards the lungs. The lungs will be then oxygenating this blood and sending it back to the heart by the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. So this is the blood which has come from the lungs into the left atrium. And from the left atrium, it has to go to the left ventricle. So let us locate both of them. This is the blood in the left atrium and being pushed towards the 
left ventricle but only after passing through the left atrioventricular valve which is called as the mitral valve it is a bicuspid valve so here is the mitral valve or the left atrioventricular valve after the contraction as the blood has passed from the atria to ventricle it will close and the closure produces the m1 sound the first heart sound now the blood which was there in the left ventricle has to be pushed into the aorta and to the systemic circulation as the blood is passing from the left ventricle into the aorta it has to pass through the aortic valve and then only it can move towards the systemic circulation as shown here in the aorta so what is the location of the aortic valve it is very close to the mitral valve as you can see this is going to the aortic valve now as i mentioned the location of the valve and the location of the heart sound is different because the heart sound is heard along the downstream of the blood flow not exactly on the location of the cardiac valve which you will be understanding better when you look at this diagram but this sound which is due to closure of the aortic valve is a2 the second heart sound so a2 and p2 the second heart sound and m1 and t1 the first heart sound let us locate them now in this particular diagram as is evident the blood which was coming from the right atrium towards the right ventricle passing through the tricuspid valve giving us the t1 component or the first heart sound component look at the direction of the blood flow if this is the location of the cardiac valve along the downstream will be hearing the sound of the heart or maybe a cardiac murmur which could be due to tricuspid regurgitation or maybe stenosis so where exactly is that downstream as you see it is marked here most of the books will tell it is behind the lower end of the sternum and towards the left side in relation to the fifth rib or fifth intercostal space though you will find some of the books mentioning it on the right side same level few authors will mention it is in the middle of the sternum so which one should we follow as most of the authors are telling the blood flow which is passing through the tricuspid valve the downstream is here that is where we are putting the stethoscope diaphragm and it is the fifth rib on the left side or fifth intercostal space so this is the auscultatory site for tricuspid valve now where the blood was going the blood has to pass from the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk and there'll be the p2 sound but it is not exactly heard on the location of the valve but along the downstream of the blood slightly higher you can find that this flow is upward and towards the left side so upward and towards the left side means it will be heard here in the second intercostal space on the left side so this is the auscultatory site for p2 the closure of the pulmonary valve so this was t1 the tricuspid valve auscultation area there is the p2 pulmonary valve auscultation area where the blood will go now it will go to the lungs and get oxygenated come back to the left atrium and then passing the mitral valve as you notice the blood which has come from the lungs passing the mitral valve the downstream is towards the cardiac apex so the mitral valve auscultation is at the location of the cardiac apex which is here and where exactly is that that is the fifth intercostal space below the level of the nipple slightly medial and more exactly you can say nine centimeter from the mid sternal line towards the left side so that is the location of the cardiac apex or you can listen to the sounds coming from the mitral valve maybe mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis the murmur due to regurgitated blood is auscultated here now where the blood was going from the left ventricle it has to pass the aortic valve and as we have discussed the murmurs or the heart sounds they're not felt at the location of the valve but along the downstream so where is it going upwards and to the right side upward and to the right side actually it will go to the second intercostal space but on the right side because the blood flow is like that in the aorta the aorta moves upwards and to the right side as you have discussed where the pulmonary trunk moves pulmonary trunk lies in front of the aorta and it moves to upward and left direction and that is why we could auscultate the pulmonary valve murmurs on the left side now to memorize these murmurs let us make a circle you have to just remember this is m1 mitral valve closure producing the first heart sound this is t1 
tricuspid well producing the second heart sound so m1 t1 and then then you complete the circle go towards the aorta this is the a2 diuretic valve closure producing the second heart sound and this is the p2 that is the pulmonary valve closure producing the second heart sound and again you can come back here m1 t1 a2 p2 so m1 t1 is the first heart sound as you follow this circular path and then you have to come to a2 and the p2 the aortic valve closure and the pulmonary valve closure and you can make the circle again m1 t1 is the first heart sound the lub and a2 p2 is the second heart sound which is the dub and just remember it is the second intercostal space the a2 and p2 you have to put your stethoscope here for aortic valve sound or murmurs p2 the pulmonary valve closure or the murmurs m1 the fifth intercostal space about nine centimeter from the mid-sternal line and t1 tricuspid valve murmurs can be heard at the lower end of the sternum more towards the left side at the level of fifth rib or fifth intercostal space now you know the answer to the question let us go back to our question as we can make out this is the marker a the second intercostal space on the right side you can count the ribs by palpating on the anterior thoracic wall a prominent ridge which is between the manubrium and the body of sternum and as you feel that ridge at the manubrial sternal junction that is where the second rib is coming on either side and just below the second rib you have the second intercostal space if it is on the right side it is the oscillatory site of the aortic valve and if it is on the left side it is the pulmonary valve a2 p2 second heart sound and what about the M1 T1? M1 is at the cardiac apex, fifth intercostal space, nine centimeter from the mid sternal line. And T1, T1 is at the level of fifth intercostal space, or you can say fifth rib, posterior to the sternum, lower end of sternum, more towards the left side. So M1 and T1. Now you can see A is aortic, so you can find A is aortic. This could be the answer, but then D can also be the answer. So what about the marker B? Marker B is pulmonary. So marker B is pulmonary, but it is not given here as pulmonary. It is mentioned tricuspid, so D cannot be the answer. And hence our answer will be choice number B. A is the aortic, B is pulmonary. Where is the C? The tricuspid valve and about the D, it is the mitral valve. So we were being asked the correct matching and we have found the correct matching for the oscillatory site here. We should keep our answer as choice number B then. Here we are being asked about this muscle of the anterior arm biceps brachii that while it is doing the elbow flexion it is working under which category of muscle? Is it an agonist? or antagonist, a fixator, a synergist. The muscles are classified chiefly into four types according to the movement they are doing at a particular joint or at various joints. And remember, a muscle like biceps brachii could be a prime mover for one particular movement, but it may be working like a fixator for other type of movement or at another joint. So what exactly is a prime mover? Prime mover is the muscle which is going to initiate the movement and consistently active during the full range of the movement. Like if we are being asked about the biceps brachii doing the elbow flexion as you are lifting the forearm, this is the muscle which will be initiating the movement and consistently active while the movement keep happening. Also, wherever the muscle is inserting, the insertion comes close to the origin. You know, biceps brachii has two heads, biceps, two heads, originating from the scapula, inserting on chiefly the radius. So it will pull the radius towards the scapula. We'll see that in a diagram now. And here we can see this is the biceps brachii muscle called biceps because it is having two heads of origin, both of them coming from the scapula bone, one is from the supraglenoid tubercle, the other one is from the coracoid process. So scapula is the origin and when you are talking about the insertion, it is chiefly on the radius bone. And during the muscle contraction, the length of the muscle is going to shorten. So obviously the insertion is going to move towards the origin. Elevating the forearm upward, that is what the elbow flexion. So initiation of the movement and carrying out the movement, remaining active consistently is 
a prime mover. So the biceps brachii is the prime mover or what you can call it as the agonist muscle. Then there is one antagonistic muscle, the one which is relaxing while the agonist is contracting. And here it is the triceps muscle, the muscle with the three heads and it is working like antagonist. It is for elbow extension. So when we are elevating the forearm for flexion, the biceps is undergoing contraction. The same time, triceps is going to relax. Actually, they have reciprocal innervation from the spinal cord. While one muscle is contracting, other has to relax. And that is how the movement becomes smooth. Obviously, if you are doing the elbow extension, then in that movement, the biceps has to relax. It becomes antagonistic muscle. While the triceps muscle is contracting, it is the agonistic muscle for elbow extension. We have to understand one other thing. The long head of the biceps brachii which is attaching to supraglenoid tubercle is working like a fixator muscle also so as to fix the scapula which is the origin site of the deltoid muscle. The deltoid muscle lateral fibers while they are doing the shoulder abduction that means they are elevating the humerus bone away from the body that shoulder abduction being done by deltoid cannot be effective if the biceps brachii was not holding onto the scapula bone and thus working like a fixator. It is fixing the origin of another muscle, the deltoid, which is also being fixed by the rotator cuff. You know, there are six muscles which will be sitting on the greater tubercle and lesser tubercle of the bone humerus and they are fixating the shoulder joint. So as the lateral fibers of deltoid can do powerful abduction so deltoid is the prime mover or agonist muscle whereas the fixator muscles are long head of the biceps along with subscapularis and supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor making the rotator cuff there. Let me give you one other example of fixator muscle. Say you have the anterior forearm muscles like flexor distorum profundus, flexor distorum superficialis. These are the muscles having long tendon and whichever joints they are going to cross, they are going to fold them, flex them. The name is flexor, though chiefly their function is to flex the fingers. But they are also going to flex the metacarpophalangeal joint. They also flex the wrist joint. So wherever the tendons are passing, they are going to fold everything. Obviously, this cannot give me a stronger grip. If you want the grip to be strong, the wrist cannot be flexed, it must be extended. The holding power, grip power is better if your wrist is in extension. So which muscles are helping here for wrist extension? The extensors of the forearm, like extensor carpus ulnaris, extensor carpus radialis, they extend the wrist and they're helping the flexor muscles. This is called the synergist action. The extensors of the forearm are working like a synergist so that the flexors can give you a good grip. The extensors of the forearm are contradicting the flexion movement of forearm flexors at the wrist joint so that they can do better finger flexion and good grip movement. For FDS and FDP, the ECRL, ECRB, ECU, they're all working like synergist. So here we have seen the prime movers, agonist, the antagonist muscle, the fixator muscle, and the synergist muscle also. And then we can go back to our question. The biceps brachii, while lifting the forearm, which is the elbow flexion is working like, it is the prime mover or the agonist muscle. Choice number A is the answer. Though it was also working like a fixator, especially the long head of the biceps brachii holding the origin of deltoid muscle so that the deltoid itself, which is agonist for shoulder abduction, can work properly. Even the rotator cuff is working like a fixator for the deltoid muscle as abductor. And for antagonist, we have seen the triceps muscle is working antagonistically while we are doing elbow flexion. It will undergo relaxation while biceps is undergoing contraction. And synergist, we have discussed muscles like the extensor carpi radialis or extensor carpus ulnaris. They are working like synergist for the prime movers, which were flexor distorum superficialis or flexor distorum profundus, so that we can have a good grip by flexing the fingers, but the wrist must be extended by the synergist muscles. Anyhow, we'll keep our answer as choice number A here.
We have got a patient of uh, leprosy that might be involving some of the nerves and uh, the patient has actually presented with some deformity. The photograph is given here. We want to know which nerve has been compromised here. And as you look at this diagram, immediately you can make out there is a claw hand deformity and that too involving only the finger number 4 and 5, the medial two fingers. So the fingers appear to be normal. But then it can be confusing and you have to see multiple cases so that you become confident of identifying a deformity just by looking at it. Actually, this could be a case of leprosy which has involved the ulnar nerve. You can actually feel the ulnar nerve behind the mid epicondyle. It has become thickened. Its functionality is compromised. The ulnar nerve is supposed to supply one and a half muscles in the anterior forearm and almost all the muscles of the hand, especially towards the hypothenar little finger side, though it is also supplying one muscle of the thumb. Usually the thumb side muscles are supplied by median nerve, not the ulnar nerve. So this is going to be ulnar nerve involvement leading to ulnar claw hand, partial claw hand deformity. Let us look at the course of the ulnar nerve and discuss this deformity in detail. Here we are looking from the front view. It is the right sided forearm and the hand and you can find the ulnar nerve passing behind the medial epicondyle there. In this leprosy patient, if you palpate the ulnar nerve behind the medial epicondyle, you'll find it will be thickened and the function of the nerve has been compromised. This nerve has to supply one and a half muscle in the anterior forearm and almost all the muscles of the hand except the one which is supplied by the median nerve which is actually towards the thenar side. So what are muscles it is supplying? First of all one and a half muscle in the anterior forearm like one of them is flexor carpus ulnaris which is going to flex the carpus the wrist joint from the ulnar side. Flex the carpus wrist and that too from the ulnar side. That is why the name of the muscle is flexor carpus ulnaris. So one muscle and then another half of the muscle, which is the medial half of the flexor digitorum profundus. This is a profundus deep muscle for flexing the digits, especially the medial finger number 4, 5. So as you talk about the FDP, it is going to flex these two fingers. The muscle inserts on the distal phalanx, so it can flex the DIP, PIP, MC, even the wrist joint, the flexor distorum profundus. So after supplying one and a half muscle in the anterior forearm, the learner will come here and supply the hypothenar muscles, the muscles towards the little finger, though it is also going to supply one of the thumb muscle, the deep muscle A double D, adductor pollicis muscle, though most of the thumb muscles are under median nerve. Now a nerve is going to supply the medial two lumbricals, that is for finger number four and five, whereas the lumbrical for the lateral fingers will be supplied by the median nerve. So lumbrical one and two supplied by the median nerve, whereas the ulnar nerve is supplying lumbrical three and four. The ulnar nerve also supply eight interosseae, the four dorsal and four palmar interosseae. And obviously if ulnar nerve is compromised, all the interosseae will be compromised. We know that the function of palmar interosseae is for A double D, adduction of the fingers at the knuckles, whereas the dorsal interosseae for or abducting a b abducting the fingers at the knuckle joint pad and dab now these interosseae they have one more function they are assisting the lumbricals so what is lumbrical doing lumbricals are basically for mcp flexion and ip extension which can be seen in the next diagram the lumbricals being assisted by the interosseae for the flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint and extension of the interphalangeal joint let us look at the diagram now the lumbricals are working for metacarpophalangeal joint flexion, the knuckle flexion, and then PIP joint, DIP joint extension. They can do extension at the interphalangeal joint because they are inserting on the dorsal digital expansion. The extensor distorum muscle will have a modification dorsal digital expansion, which is obviously for extending the digits. But in extending the digits, you have quite a good contribution from the hand muscles, the lumbricals inserting on dorsal digital expansion for interphalangeal 
phalangeal extension. The thing is, the lumbricals, when they are doing this movement of MCT flexion and interphalangeal joint extension, they are being assisted by the interosseae muscles. The interosseae are for adduction and abduction, but they help the lumbricals here. What will happen if lumbricals and interosseae are not working? If one set of muscle is not working, the other set of muscles, they become more powerful and they bring the deformity. If the patient is unable to use the lumbricals and interosseae for MCP flexion, then MCP joint goes into hyperextension. As you can see, all the fingers are going into hyperextension. But why? Because the posterior forearm muscles, they have become more powerful. So posterior forearm muscles like extensor digitorum, they become more powerful. They are not being balanced by lumbrical interosseae. If one group of muscle is not working properly, then the other group of muscle become more powerful, leading to deformity like hyperextension of the MCP joint. And what is happening to the interphalangeal joint? Interphalangeal joints are undergoing flexion. So PIP joint flexion, DIP joint flexion, because if lumbrical interosseae are unable to do interphalangeal extension, then they will not be able to balance the anterior forearm muscles, the flexor distorum muscle, maybe profundus and superficialis, but profundus is more important. So why the fingers go into flexion deformity? Because unopposed action of flexor distorum profundus and superficialis. If the hand muscles are paralyzed, it is the forearm muscles which become more powerful and bring the deformity. Let us discuss this once again in the next diagram. This is our patient who had leprosy involving the ulnar nerve and you can find the metacarpophalangeal joint for the medial two fingers is in hyperextension. Whereas the interphalangeal joints, maybe the PIP or DIP, they are in flexion. This is a partial claw hand or ulnar claw hand and it happens because the medial to lumbrical supplied by the ulnar nerve have been compromised. If one group of muscle is compromised, the other group of muscle become more powerful. Since the lumbricals are unable to do MCP flexion, MCP joint goes into hyperextension. And that hyperextension at the knuckle joint or MCP joint is due to the unopposed extensor digitorum muscle, the posterior forearm muscle. And why there is interphalangeal flexion? Because the anterior forearm muscle, FDP, specifically flexor distorum profundus, become more powerful. So interphalangeal joint go into flexion deformity due to unopposed flexor distorum muscle. Muscles, hence the claw hand deformity. Now the problem may arise when you find two patients simultaneously and you have to identify whether it is ulnar claw hand or complete claw hand. Complete claw hand can happen in cases like there was a wrist slash injury. The patient has damaged median nerve as well as ulnar nerve. Then you will have complete claw hand deformity. Let us look at a photograph for that as well. And now here we are having three different type of presentations. This is the case we were talking about the leprosy patient with ulnar nerve injury and leading to partial claw hand or ulnar claw hand. MCP hyperextension and IP flexion. But this patient and that patient, they are appearing the same. Is this also partial claw hand or ulnar claw hand? No. Understand, this is ulnar claw hand. It remains all the time. The deformity is persisting all the time. But this is median claw hand or what you call it as the hand of benediction. Now, what is this hand of benediction? Actually, as we will sometime notice in the church, the priest is giving you blessing in that format. May the God bless the couple. So the name comes from there and it can be a presentation in median nerve injury. Now remember, in this patient, the deformity may not be visible at the first go. It becomes visible when you ask the patient to make a fist. And when the patient is trying to make a fist, what you find is only these fingers are able to fold, not the other three fingers. So instead of making a full fist, these three fingers, they lag behind and only these two fingers are working. So when will this happen? 
why these fingers are not folding because to fold the thumb you need flexor pollicis longus and to fold these two fingers you need lateral half of flexor deserum profundus what happened in this patient is there was a median nerve injury at or near the elbow joint and if median nerve is compromised here the radial half of flexor deserum profundus is compromised patient find difficulty folding these fingers and also flexor pollicis longus have been compromised so patient cannot fold the thumb then how come the patient was able to fold these two fingers because we have learnt earlier the flexor distorum profundus for these two fingers is supplied by ulnar nerve and ulnar nerve is working perfectly fine. The middle half of FDP is working fine because ulnar nerve is fine so these fingers will be able to fold. Problem was with median nerve and as the median nerve is compromised radial half of flexor distorum profundus is compromised flexor pulses longus is compromised you cannot fold the hand but still this hand deformity and this hand deformity they are appearing the same how will i find the difference first of all this is always persisting deformity and this deformity will become evident once you ask the patient to make a fist and number two can you notice here there is hyper extension of the metacarpophalangeal joint which is not seen here you will not find hyper extension of mcp joint here that is one of the other difference and what is this case here this is as you know wrist drop and when will you get a case of wrist drop the wrist drop cases we know are due to the radial nerve injury say there was a radial nerve injury mid shaft fracture humerus and extensor muscles compromise so extensors of the forearm which extend the wrist are not working that's why there is a wrist drop this is radial nerve injury this is median nerve injury and this we have already seen the leprosy patient ulnar nerve injury let's go back to our question now where we were being asked a known case of uh, leprosy and presenting with this particular deformity and which nerve have been compromised. Since we understand it is a case of partial claw hand, a lar nerve claw hand. So we'll keep our answer as choice number A here. The ulnar claw hand and we have discussed in median claw hand there'll be a hand of benediction if it is median and ulnar nerve both damage like it may happen in a wrist slash injury then there'll be a complete claw hand not only the medial two fingers will be involved but the other fingers will also get involved mcp hyperextension ip flexion will be found in all the four fingers that is ulnar and median claw hand deformity or complete claw hand deformity and if it is radial nerve we have discussed it will be a straw presentation. This particular question is asking us about the neurovascular bundle location. That where is it located? And what you find is there are several muscles given which belong to anterior abdominal wall. When you look at the anterior abdominal wall, you'll find that there is the most external muscle, which is external oblique. If you remove that, then there'll be internal oblique muscle. If you remove that one as well, then you have transversus abdominis muscle. Whereas there is one muscle in the midline that is rectus abdominis muscle. But here they are focusing upon the muscles which are more lateral fully present as the name are suggesting and to tell you the neurovascular bundle is lying between the inner two muscles that is transversus abdominis and internal oblique muscle let us take a transverse section in the anterior abdominal wall region and look at the muscles first and as you see this transverse section is going to talk about a muscle which is in the midline that is the rectus abdominis but along with that the three muscles which are present in the anterior lateral aspect we have discussed external oblique internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscle they contribute to a sheath which is rectus sheath which has to enclose the rectus abdominis muscle as you see this is the rectus sheath which is enclosing the rectus abdominis muscle which is lying in the midline region as we have discussed to be covered by rectus sheath so this is the muscle on the right side and this is the left counterpart but we are not focusing upon this rectus abdominis muscle as per the question according to the question we have to talk about the three muscles which are on the anterior lateral abdominal wall like we have seen the most
most anterior external oblique muscle which is shown here and then deeper to that is the internal oblique muscle which is shown here and the deepermost is transversus abdominis muscle which you can mark here the transversus abdominis muscle and if you are talking about the neurovascular bundle we have already mentioned the nerves the arteries and the veins are lying between the inner two muscles so let me represent it here the nerves will be entering this plane the plane which is lying between the transversus abdominis and the internal oblique similarly if you are talking about the arteries and the veins let us show it here even the arteries will be following the nerve in the same plane the plane which is lying between the inner two muscles actually we have got one diagram let us focus upon that diagram it will become more evident there so this is the diagram we were talking about and regarding the neurovascular bundle we have a similar diagram here let us start from the posterior aspect where you have got the spinal cord and which is giving some intercostal nerves and we want to see where is the location of these intercostal nerves so this is the spinal cord here as you can mark in the diagram and from the spinal cord let us take out the ventral root dorsal root joining to form the spinal nerve so so here is the ventral root that is the dorsal root joining to form the spinal nerve which is shown here and the spinal nerve further divides into two the posterior ramus and the anterior ramus so this is the spinal cord giving the dorsal root ventral root joining to form the spinal nerve and spinal nerve itself giving a posterior ramus anterior ramus it is the anterior ramus which will continue as the intercostal nerve supplying anterior abdominal wall muscle let us follow this anterior ramus which is working like the intercostal nerve and as you follow that you can see it is uh, sandwiched between the inner two muscles let us represent the muscles as well so the innermost muscle was the transversus abdominis muscle which you can see here and the one which is exterior to that is internal oblique muscle so internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis muscle they are sandwiching the intercostal nerve that is a surgical plane where you find not only nerve but the blood vessel also say for example on the posterior abdominal wall you have the aorta and it is giving us the posterior intercostal arteries and if you follow the posterior intercostal arteries they will also enter the same neurovascular plane which we have mentioned as the gap between the innermost muscle transversus abdominis and the exterior muscle which is internal oblique muscle so that is the neurovascular bundle and the muscle which is deeper to that is the transversus abdominis muscle and the muscle which is exterior to that is the internal oblique muscle that should give us our answer let's go back to the question then see all this information you'll find is important when you are operating on the patients like incisional hernias or giving some sutures to access the internal organs like appendicitis patient all this information comes handy then and obviously as we could see the neurovascular bundle which is intercostal nerves and intercostal arteries they are lying between the inner two muscles the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis muscle choice number b should be our answer here that is the neurovascular plane we have just discussed choice number b is the most precise answer here here we are being asked about the procedure which artery are you palpating in this particular manner so this examiner is going to put his fingers at this particular location to palpate which artery and the names given are anterior tibial the posterior tibial dorsalis pedis which is actually the continuation of anterior tibial artery itself on the dorsum of the foot and then medial plantar which is a branch of the posterior tibial artery it is the posterior tibial artery which will be giving us the medial and lateral plantar arteries so that the sole area can be supplied so which artery are you talking about since you are going posterior to tibia it could be posterior tibial artery not the anterior tibial artery because the anterior tibial artery will continue anterior to tibia and go on the dorsal of the foot so if you want to palpate the anterior tibial artery or the dorsal spiritus artery you should be on the anterior aspect not the posterior aspect 
And if you are posterior to the tibia in the calf region and entering the ankle region, this is going to be the posterior tibial artery you are palpating passing under the flexor retinaculum and then giving two branches under flexor retinaculum, the medial plantar artery and the lateral plantar artery. Both of them given under the flexor retinaculum. Flexor retinaculum is on the medial side of the ankle attaching to medial malleus and the heel bone calcaneum. You have to relax the flexor retinaculum by asking the patient to do inversion and as the flexor retinaculum is relaxed you take your three fingers remember the index finger should be towards the heart that is what you are taught in the first year mbbs index finger should be towards the heart and there should be three fingers put on the artery it is the middle finger which will be feeling the pulse so this is about the postural artery you are feeling why you want to palpate the artery maybe it is a case of thromboangitans obliterans or the Berger disease. 40 year male, chronic cigarette smoker, intermittent claudication means when the patient is walking there is pain and the pain disappears and the patient is taking rest. So features of Berger disease or maybe the patient is developing some ischemic features like ischemia of the toes which might lead to gangrene later, amputation all that. You don't want that. So you have to feel the pulse, the volume of the pulse. Maybe there was some atherosclerosis, narrowing of the lumen and the pulse will become weak. You have to palpate the postural artery. You have to palpate the continuation of anterior artery also. That is dorsal spedis artery but on the dorsum of the foot not here. Let me show another diagram for this postural artery. So here as we can see the hand is going posterior to tibia. It is the palpation of posterior tibial artery which is passing under the flexor retinaculum. As you can see on the medial side of the ankle you have the medial malleus at the lower end of the tibia bone and attaching to medial malleus is the flexor retinaculum which is going to further attach to the heel bone calcaneus bone located here. So this is the calcaneus bone and attaching to calcaneus bone and medial malleus tibia is the flexor retinaculum. You have to relax this flexor retinaculum by turning the sole inside, inside, inversion and then you can palpate this artery. So what is that mnemonic which is telling us about the structures passing under flexor retinaculum? That was the Tom, Dick and Harry anterior to posterior or you can say medial to lateral. So what is this Tom, Dick and Harry the expansion of the mnemonic? The Tom, the T is tibialis posterior tendon coming from the calf region posterior leg compartment. Then who is the D? D is digitorum, the flexor digitorum, longus tendon, A for artery and for nerve. Because they are coming from the calf region posterior to tibia, their name are posterior tibial artery and posterior tibial nerve. So A for the artery and for the nerve. You can see them here now, posterior tibial artery and posterior tibial nerve. And what about this hairy? The halosis, flexor, flexor halosis, the one which will flex the great toe. So so you can also talk about flexor halosis longus tendon. Flexor halosis longus tendon which is passing under the flexor retinaculum, under the sustentaculum talus of calcaneum bone and then it is going to pull the great toe, flex the great toe. That is why the name is flexor hairy or flexor halosis longus. And this artery as we are talking about, the posterior tibial artery can be palpated under flexor retinaculum, posterior and inferior to medial malleus. It is lying between the medial malleus and the heel bone. Actually a question came, a tendon attaching to the medial malleus coming from the calf region, the tendocalcaneus. So you can mention the artery is palpated between two structures, the medial malleus and tendocalcaneus attaching to calcaneus bone for a case of peripheral vascular disease. And it is this artery while passing under flexor reticulum will be giving two branches. One is the medial plantar artery Artery. The other is lateral plantar artery to supply the sole skin and sole muscles. That was one of the options in our question. Let us go back to the question now. The examiner palpating which artery lying posterior and inferior to the medial malleus under flexor retinaculum. The mnemonic is Tom, Dick and Harry. A for the artery, posterior tibial artery. So our answer is choice number B here.
The present question is asking us about the dermatomes of the lower limb, especially this shaded area. The arrow mark is given. This is basically the territory of a nerve, which is called as the saphenous nerve, which is a branch of the femoral nerve. So femoral nerve give a cutaneous branch, the saphenous nerve. What is the root value of the nerve then? Since the femoral nerve is having the root value L234, it must be lying within that range. In fact, it is L4 and the saphenous nerve with L4 is coming till the medial malleolus region. Remember the dermatome or medial malleolus and some part of the skin on the medial margin on the dorsum of the foot but not reaching great toe. So great toe must be excluded. That area is L4 dermatome. Now if great toe is to be excluded then what is the dermatome of the great toe? Great toe is always L5. So remember the great is always L5, especially the dorsum of the first web space is L5 dermatome. Then what about the little toe? Little toe is the next number that is S1 dermatome. So when it comes to the lateral margin on the dorsum of the foot and the little toe it is S1 dermatome. You can see it is in a sequence L4, L5 and S1 medial to lateral. Let us look at a diagram by Harrison Madison for more explanation. We are taking the diagram from Harrison because it matches with Gray's anatomy as well. Otherwise, there's a lot of controversy regarding this territory. So we are looking from the front view as was given in the diagram, but we have to look from the posterior aspect as well. First, we are focusing upon the anterior aspect as we have discussed earlier. The medial aspect of the knee joint, the medial side of the leg and the medial malleolus and the medial margin on the dorsum of the foot is L4 dermatome, but it does not reach the great toe. Great toe is L5 dermatome as seen here, especially the dorsum of the first web space. So this is the L5 territory. Where is the S1? As we have seen, we have to go medial to lateral and the lateral margin of the dorsum of the foot and the little toe is S1 territory. Now as you mark the S1 territory here, this is the dorsum of the foot. What about the sole or the posterior aspect? Now you will notice on the dorsum S1 territory is smaller. It is with the little toe but as you go to the sole it becomes larger. Larger. So this is S1 little toe on the sole but is encroaching more as compared with the L5. L5 on the dorsum of the foot is covering more area but as it goes to the sole area the territory becomes smaller. But still you should know the great toe will remain L5. May it be on the dorsum of the foot or the sole. Then where is L4? L4 never reaches the great toe. It remains with the medial mellus there. So you can mark the medial mellus territory here and that is the L4. L4 seen on the anterior as well as posterior side never reaching great toe. Which nerve was that? That was saphenous nerve branch of the femoral nerve. And which nerve supply the dorsum of the first web space? Deep perineal nerve. Otherwise most of the dorsum of the foot is supplied by superficial perineal nerve. And what about the dorsum of the little toe or lateral margin? That is sural nerve S1 root value branch of posterior tibial nerve. So you must remember all those territories. We can magnify this region now and revise it quickly. So what is the name of this nerve supplying the little toe and lateral margin on the dorsum of the foot with the S1 root value? That is the territory of sural nerve which is itself a branch of the posterior tibial nerve. Okay then what about the most of the dorsum of the foot? Most of the dorsum of the foot will be supplied by the superficial perineal nerve whereas if you are talking about this area the dorsum of the first web space then that is under the nerve deep perineal nerve dermatome L5 as we have mentioned great toe is always L5 and as we come back to the question which we had medial malleolus lower end of the tibia this is supplied by the saphenous nerve and which itself is a branch of the femoral nerve is being supplied by 
by L4 dermatome. And now we can go back to our question to mark our answer. The question asking us dermatome of the shaded area, which is none other than the L4 dermatome. So the answer should be choice number C here. The L4 root value. It will be compromised when you are uh, stripping the great saphenous vein and you have injured the saphenous nerve. Then the patient will come to you postoperatively, complaining of loss of sensation in the territory of the saphenous nerve. It is one of the iatrogenic injuries. You might have taken the great saphenous vein for coronary artery bypass graft. The present question is asking us about the lateral dislocation of the patella during the knee flexion. Which factors are going to prevent that? Is it the vastus medialis muscle or the patellar tendon further becoming the patellar ligament, the insertion of the cordis femoris, or the gracilis muscle or the rectus femoris muscle? Let us discuss this in a diagram first. We are looking at the front view of the right knee joint, which is a complex synovial joint since it is made up of more than two bones. The one which is coming from the superior aspect is the femur bone, articulating with the inferior bone, the tibia bone, but there's a third bone also, the patella. Now we can go back to our question and find out. Do we have this name, medial patellar femoral ligament in the option? Or at least medial patellar retinaculum in the option? And if none of them is there, then do we have vestus medialis in the option? Let's go back and look at the options then. So this was our question in the flexion lateral dislocation of patella is being prevented by that could be a bony surface modification or a muscle or a retinaculum or a ligament. So as you search for the answer, the only possible answer here is the vestus medialis. So choice number A should be our answer. But be careful if in the option you are having medial patellar retinaculum, then it will be a better answer. Still better answer will be if you are having that particular name, a part of the medial patellar retinaculum called as medial patellofemoral ligament as we have discussed 60 to 70 percent of the cases this is the ligament which is found broken and you have to reconstruct it to prevent the recurrent lateral dislocation of patella so best answer here if not found then here and if that is not found then we will definitely go for choice number a in this particular question answer should be choice number a